The current healthcare system isn't about health, wellness, and longevity. It's crisis intervention and revenue generation. Lee and I came together with this passion for better nutrition, proper exercise, the importance of sleep and community yeah. engagement. Welcome to the Crisco and Company podcast. I'm Lee Crisco, MD, and this is my wife, Joyce, from Crisco and Company. And today we have uh, special guests. We have Tim and Heather Kaufman, who have fascinating weight loss and health restoration uh, stories to tell us uh, based on, you know, plant-based living. So we're really excited to hear their story. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, yeah. thank you very yeah. much. We're very pleased to have you here. So why don't we just throw it open? How did you get into the plant-based space and how did you learn about it and what happened when you started to do it? Well, so it's kind of weird because I am the furthest thing you would ever think that would go plant-based. We live in kind of a, you know, rural place. It's kind of farm country. I grew up hunting, fishing. Um, we raised most of our own meat. We processed our own meat. Um, and my diet consisted mostly of meat and dairy products with as few veggies as possible. So to see how I eat now, it's uh, 180 degrees different. Um, but, you know, the first thing I want to say before we even start is our story, you know, it sounds a little wild. Like together, we've lost 290 pounds. And that's not the good thing. The good thing is, uh, we live a healthy, happy, and active life now uh, on this lifestyle. And, you know, I think the weight is kind of a, a side effect of, of getting healthy. But mm -hmm. what I really want people to know before we even start is this lifestyle is out there for anyone that's willing to choose it. There's no magic. I didn't have willpower. If I had willpower, I would have never got over 400 pounds, right? Um, so I want, when we share our story, um, know that anyone can do this, right? So I'm going to go kind of the condensed version. I'm going to start way back uh, when I was a kid because Heather and I kind of started dating when we were 14 years old. So wow. <laughs> <laughs> we've been together a long time. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, we both of us grew up in kind of a rural place. We still live here today. It's not as rural as it used to be, um, but everyone got jobs on farms. And I happened to live across the street from a dairy farm of about 70 head. And that's what I did. And I worked really hard and I got hurt a lot. So, you know, I lift a pail up and kind of feel my wrists have this weird sensation. Um, I was always twisting my ankles, always getting hurt. We just thought I was accident prone. And as time went on, we got to be 18 and thinking about getting married. And um, so I had to get a job in a factory. And we got married when I had just turned 20 and I started my new job in the factory and I started working over my head, which I hadn't really done before. At this point, I was lifting mostly, you know, up to the ground, you know, from the ground to my waist. And when I started reaching up in the air, my shoulder started like popping out of the socket. And it got to the point it was so bad uh, over the months that I would actually sneeze and it would dislocate my shoulder, just the pressure from my rib cage. Um, so I went to the a doctor and he said, we can fix that. We're just going to go in there. We're going to cut you um, behind your shoulder and we're going to kind of tighten everything up, patch you back up. You'll be on your way. When the doctor got in there to do the surgery, he started stretching things around and he noticed there was something more wrong than just a bad shoulder. Um, everything was super elastic. So I was diagnosed with this disease called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, uh, which is a connective tissue disorder, this genetic, and basically the glue that kind of holds my body together, the collagen, um, has a mutation, so it's very stretchy. And the more it stretches, just like bubble gum, the thinner it gets, the more fragile things get, and the more things break down. When I was young, it didn't bother me too badly. I mean, I did have a lot of like dislocations. I always said I was double jointed. Um, but as I got older into my mid 20s, the damage started happening where I was knocking, you know, the cartilage off the joints every time I put like a divot in there. Um, and so along with the diagnosis came a bunch of narcotics. I got put, um, this is back in the, what, 
mm-hmm. late 90s, you know, um, when they were prescribing narcotics like <laughs> like it was nuts. Um, so I went on, you know, lower tab and build up a tolerance to them, found myself switching to Percocet and eventually Oxys. And um, I became an addict without even knowing it. Mm-hmm. So I went um, to the doctor and I was still in pain. And he said, I want you to try this new drug. And I had never heard of this drug. It wasn't, you know, a big thing at the time, but the drug was fentanyl. And this was a transdermal patch. So it would be on my skin and I would just be supplied with this medicine. Along with that, I stayed on all the other opioids um, as kind of breakthrough pain or what they say, stay ahead of the pain. And, you know, the prognosis for me was they figured, you know, by the time I was in my mid 20s or early 30s, that I certainly would be in a wheelchair. Uh, The orders were to do as little as you possibly can to save as many joints as possible, uh, because my body was already full of arthritis and the x-rays looked like I was 90 years old already. So I did what they said. Um, You can imagine at some point this physical pain that I was trying to mask eventually turned into emotional pain um, because I didn't like who I was becoming. What's really kind of weird to talk about is fast food and hyper-processed food uh, gave me the same kind of dopamine hit that the narcotics gave me. Mm -hmm. And so I found that it was a lot easier to get four double cheeseburgers Uh, than it was to try to find fentanyl without a prescription or trying to manipulate the system. Um, So I got addicted to fast food. I was addicted to opioids and uh, it still wasn't enough. I still, I would go days without sleeping. I was in constant pain um, and I just wanted to escape. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a, a household with no alcohol. Um, I never saw my parents drink, but I didn't drink. We, I mean, we were so young when we got married, we kind of missed all that partying scene. I stopped on the way home from work and I picked up a bottle of vodka, a 1.75 liter bottle. I went home that night before I be- went to bed. I had a palm full of opioids. I popped them in my mouth and I drank an entire liter of vodka and I passed out. And unfortunately, this would become my new routine every single day. Every day before I went to bed, I drank it just like a couple glasses of water. Um, I would drink this vodka and pass out. Um, Actually, I would do more than pass out. I would actually black out. Um, And this became my life. And uh, to say I was spiraling out of control is kind of an understatement. By the time I was 38, I had weighed well over 400. We don't really know how much over 400 because the scale literally couldn't weigh me. Uh, My metabolic numbers were out of control. Um, And believe it or not, I was still in chronic pain. Um, So I was in rough shape and my doctor knew it. We knew it. I, there were nights I would lay down on my bed and I would lay the remote for the TV on my chest and it would just jump like you could see air under it with every heartbeat. Um, I would later find out that my blood pressure was 255 over 115. And this is on a calcium channel blocker and a beta blocker. Uh, my resting heart rate was usually over 125, just laying, doing nothing. Um, my cholesterol was over 300, triglycerides were de- off the charts, literally, and I was sick, I was dying. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember uh, I would go for a couple days sometimes without even urinating because I would literally shut my kidneys down. Wow. Um, and I knew exactly what was happening, um, but I just, I couldn't stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're trying to to raise kids. I still worked. I was still functional, although wasn't functioning real well. I would do my work so I could get a paycheck and I would come home and, and check out for the night. Um, and, you know, people would look at me and see the physical weight, but I could tell you the emotional weight of that life was much heavier than the physical part. Mm-hmm. life is kind of worth surviving and um, my addictions really taken on almost as a part-time job trying to keep all the medicines coming in and 
Um, and then Heather's mom gets sick and we thought she had like the flu or something like that. Um, but we begged her to go to the doctor. She led a very busy life. So she finally took time out to, to go to the doctor and she was diagnosed with leukemia. Mm. And that was like a switch went off for us. You know, we had this pattern in life, get the kids to their practices, do what we have to do. Now, all of a sudden, Ma's in the cancer hospital, which is Roswell here. So it's a world renowned uh, cancer center. And I don't know, I feel like our life just flipped from, you know, picking the kids up to practice to who's going to stay with mom tonight. And um Heather's mom was like a second mom to me I mean because we were so young you know I used to hide out over there all the time and she was a lot cooler than my mom so I you know and here she has leukemia and she's getting worse and she's terminal and at the same time we're going through all that my father um we thought he had pneumonia because he had this cold that wouldn't go away they did some chest x-rays on him and they found out that he had stage four kidney cancer that had metastasized through his entire body and ended up in his lungs. The doctor gave my dad six months to live. And my dad was my best buddy in the whole world. We did everything together. We hunted together. We fished together. We built stuff together. Um, he taught me everything, you know, and here he's got six months to live. Mm -hmm. Dad didn't make it six months. Um, he passed away six weeks uh, to the day of his diagnosis. Uh, shortly after that, Heather's mom um, would have leukemia that would turn into lymphoma. And ultimately, a brain tumor would take her life. And, you know, we lost the two most precious people on the planet. Mm -hmm. And as hard as it is to even talk about this, even though I've talked about this hundreds of times, I look back on it and the the reflections that happened through their two deaths, actually, they saved my life because when Ma was in the hospital, I can remember going up there and I remember one night specifically, I walked up to her bed and she was so tired because she was waiting for a transfusion and she opened her eyes super slow and she said, How's your knee? And like it crushed me because oh, all I God. had ever done was complain about everything that was wrong with me. And yeah, my knees were pretty jacked up, but she's laying in a bed waiting for chemo and she's worried about my knee. And it shows you the kind of person that she was, but um, it also showed me that I had a lot to be grateful for. And I had spent my life you know, praying for things to happen and, you know, just needing all this stuff. And I just recognized everything that I was without, but I never really stopped to see all the amazing things that I had. I, yeah, I had bad knees, but I had legs mm -hmm. and there were people in that hospital that were going to come home with no legs because they had tumors in them. And, um, you know, I had a lot to be grateful for. I had a family that loved me and I walked out of the hospital that night and a lot of people would never do that. I remember um, at my dad's graveside sitting there thinking that, you know, we all pay this lip service to, well, we're not promised tomorrow and life is precious, but I don't think we really grasp that idea. Um, until we're sitting at a loved one's graveside, like life is precious and we're not promised tomorrow. And that hit me too. Um, and then, you know, we're getting done with these funerals. Heather's the oldest in her family. So the, a lot of the arrangements and whatnot fell on her shoulders. And, you know, we had to help mom out on, on my part um to get all the funerals together and I remember one day you know I brought my socks to Heather just like I did a lot of mornings and because I got to the point where I literally couldn't get my socks and shoes on Heather put my sock on she kind of pats the side of my leg she says you're all set in it that it hit me that day that like I was next like I wasn't going to make it another year I kind of knew that and I honestly, I don't know that I cared one way or another. Like I was just so sick and tired of being sick and tired. But what I did care about is how I was going to have to do this funeral thing all over again. And I almost like pictured 
what that would look like. And then when the funeral's all done, she's got to raise two kids on her own. And so I yeah, I never said a word to Heather about it. It's just like I, I had this thing. It would, had bothered, I was hoping it would go away, but it was in the back of my head like all day. And I said, I have to do something. So I did what all smart people do. They go to YouTube to find good medical advice from influencers, right? And I saw this video of this really big guy. He got uh, a gastric bypass. He lost a bunch of weight. He's just as big as I was, lost a bunch of weight. And he's running a marathon a year later. I'm like, that's it. That's what I got to do. So um, this is be. But the internet wasn't really a thing yet. It, it probably was, but it was probably really slow with like dial up. So um, I found a place at the Yellow Pages that did these uh, surgeries in Buffalo. I went, I got all set up. I went to some classes. I had to go to a little conference on it. Had my big pack of paper, took it to the doctor. Had it went with because she was not a fan of this idea. And uh, that's when I found out so the nurse took my blood pressure. It was out of control at 255 over 115. My doctor was freaking out because he thought I was going to have a stroke right there. So he was going to call 911, talked him out of it. Um, he had me lay on the exam table while he saw a few more patients. I got my heart rate down. And he, he denied the surgery for me because he won he wasn't sure with all the narcotics, like how the anesthesia, how I would react to it. And two, he was really worried about my heart. So I left the doctor that day feeling hopeless, you know, but at the same time, I felt a little bit like I was off the hook, right? Like now I tried, it's not my fault. Um, but something inside me that night, I just, I couldn't stop thinking about Heather's mom and she loved life. Like she loved life. She did everything she could to hang on until the doctors, her own doctors asked her, like, what are you doing? And she said, I just want to be here for my family. And, you know, so out of respect for her, um, I had to do something. Like I had to at least try again. So so I, I went on Atkins because that was all the craze at the time. And uh, the Atkins diet, actually, it was perfect for me because it was all the things I like to eat anyways. Um, you know, do you do really creative stuff like buy pizza and just scrape the cheese and the toppings off and throw everything else out? I did honestly lose weight, but when you're over 400 pounds doesn't take much to lose weight. At the same time, I uh, changed to this Atkins diet. I also um, got out a little journal for some reason. And I don't really know why, because I had never really been interested in journaling. But I just wrote down the date. And at the top of it, I said, this is the first day of the rest of your life. And I wrote down chair times two. I knew I needed to change how I ate, but I also knew I had to start doing something. And I think I was really embarrassed because a couple of days prior to this, I had went to stand up out of my office chair and I pushed really hard on the handles and I split them both right off. And one of my colleagues wheeled me in a new chair. Ah, that chair was weak anyways. Don't worry about it. But I was not even using my legs to get up and down anymore. So I put chair times two. And what that meant to me is that was my workout for the day. I would get up out of my chair at my office. I would sit back down and get up again mm -hmm. two times. Mm -hmm. And that sounds ridiculous now, right? But what I was doing is doubling my workload. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and my idea was to just do a little bit more than I had done the day before, which wasn't much at the time. So um, I'm losing weight. I'm trying to do what I can to be a little more active. And then I sit down to watch Netflix and the film Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead comes up in my queue. Now, I had no idea what this film was, <laughs> um, but I knew it described me. And I really apologize. I feel like I'm talking. Heather's going to be chiming in here soon. We're getting to her. Love it. We love it. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> so this film title described me to the T. I didn't really know what it was, but I saw Joe Cross. Uh, the film is about this Australian. Joe Cross comes to the U.S., consumes nothing but vegetable and fruit juice out of his juicer for 60 days. 
loses a bunch of weight, gets off a bunch of meds, and on the way, he inspires a whole bunch of people in the process. And I'm like, I don't care what this guy's doing. I want what he's got. Like, I want the results that he had before the film was over. I had ordered a juicer. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, this sounds really weird, but if Joe would have been putting raccoon poop in there, that's what I would have done. <laughs> right. <laughs> I kind of didn't see the vegetable and fruit thing, right? I just wanted the results. So the juicer comes and uh, January 1st is right around the corner, which would be uh, 10 and a half years ago. Um, I 11.59, I grabbed a handful of raw fish, pickled herring, jammed it in my mouth at 11.59. And today, that's the last meat or animal product that I've ever consumed um, but it's kind of funny, <laughs> we went to go get vegetables for this juicer, and we didn't really shop much for produce. I mean, we did Totina's pizza rolls, chicken pot pies, you know, boxes of fried chicken. So we come home with produce and either <laughs> put it through the juicer, and probably a quarter cup of juice comes yeah. out. It's like, <laughs> that's going to be a problem. It's not going to sustain Yeah, me. right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know... You fast forward a couple of days when we start, well, where are we going to find produce? Like, where do people buy this stuff at? So we started finding, you know, produce companies and farmers markets. And we'd ultimately, we'd end up in restaurant stores bringing out 50 pound bales of carrots. Mm -hmm. um, but it's funny to see this big guy, you know, waving kale across the store yelling at Heather, hey, it's on sale for a dollar a bunch. Uh, but we figured that out and uh, day one through three was terrible. It was terrible. I just wanted to go to bed. And day four, um, the hunger kind of subsided. Day five, a miracle happened. And I cannot tell you how many times I've told my story. And I still get goosebumps every time I talk about this. Day five, I woke up in the morning in the same exact position. I had fallen asleep in. Wow. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted to do. All the drugs, the alcohol, I just wanted to sleep through the night and I couldn't do it. Five days on juice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Five days. That's It's amazing. Um, you know, and as the days would pass and, and the juice fast, I noticed my eczema was clearing up. I'd wake up, my eyes weren't cloudy. My sinuses would clear up. I wasn't itchy. Um, you know, things I, I would forget to take pain meds. Um, I was on a really massive uh, anti-inflammatory drug called Indocin. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd forget to take that. And, you know, I, little by little, I'm getting more energy. I'm finding she, it was a chore to like wake me up in the morning. I'd wake up before my alarm, which that was new. Um, and I got bored sitting on the couch. But one day when I was sitting on the couch, um the film forks over knives came on because mm -hmm. it was suggested mm -hmm. and forks over knives it didn't just save my life it gave me a completely new one and i can tell you i would go on to tell you that it gave a lot of people around me a new life as well mm -hmm. um the doppler effect has been amazing and my story is not you know it, it's it's not an anomaly like this happens with a ton of people that have watched that film. So basically what I learned is when I finished my fast after 30 days, I could just eat what I was juicing along with some whole grains, legumes, and nuts and seeds, and some, you know, starchy veggies. And I had myself a new diet and I've never looked back. Um, you know, the, the weight came off, but I, I don't even like talking about that because the numbers, you know, my blood pressure medicines had to get reduced so fast and they kind of faded out, um, you know, and then and then through, you know, taking care of myself, feeling better about myself, both physically and emotionally, I wanted to get off the meds and it was not an easy task and neither was the alcohol, um, you know, but I was able to break the chains of addiction uh, but something else happened that I, I enjoy hearing about more than my own story. Um, as we're going through this, Heather, Heather never really liked to cook to begin with. Um, but I knew very little. And I think 
that's what helped me. I kept things really simple in the beginning. I knew that I could take sweet potatoes, dice them up, uh, put some seasoning on, pop them in the oven, and, and that's what I would eat. And that's what I knew. I knew rice, beans, veggies, and potatoes. Um, but I would pull my sweet potatoes out of the oven, this beautiful tray, and um, somebody would start stealing the potatoes on me. And she's like, oh, <laughs> these aren't bad. Um, and we we started kind of mixing foods. Like I'd make a veggie stir fry with rice. Uh, she, for a while, you were like cooking a, a chicken breast. And then eventually, I think you just got tired of yeah. doing that. But anyways, why don't we switch gears here? Because everyone's probably sick of listening to me. And um, Heather can hop in after she stole my potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> So as Tim was going along, you know, cooking and doing this, I still wasn't sure like where this was going to go with him because, you know, we've tried lots of diets and things before and, but the food was tasting good. And like he said, I hated to cook. And so me and the kids would get our pizza and instead of getting pizza and wings, we do pizza and a salad or then, um, whatever Tim was making, we'd have that as well. So the one day I was like, why, you know, my daughter didn't like ground beef. My son, he was what I, he'd have, whatever, you know, I never really liked meat to begin with. So I'm like, why are we even cooking this meat anymore? And since I didn't like to cook, I'm like, let's just let Tim cook. So hmm. that's kind of what we did. We started doing that. And, um, as we were going along here, um, me and Tim were walking in the mall, which was my favorite exercise, was to actually just go to the mall and walk around and Not shop buying. or window shop, shop <laughs> or window shop. Yeah. And um, I had a pain in my right side and, you know, it was kind of like a cramp, but it was just wasn't going away. And I actually had an appointment um, that week with my gynecologist, my yearly um appointment and um he said that I had a fibroid and it seemed quite large and wanted me to um have a cat scan I'm like no no is it do you think it's something that I really need to do right now he said well well we could watch it and I'm like yeah let's just do that because I don't want to do get into anything else you know and um that month I had my appointment with my primary doctor and after my physical he said you know you have quite a large fibroid. I said, yeah, I, I you know, I know um, me and um, my gynecologist are watching it. We're keeping an eye on it. And he's like, well, I really want you to go get a CT, CAT scan, CT scan. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And he said, um, after that, I had came back to him and I had the size of a fibroid that was the size of a softball. Mm -hmm. And he insisted that I needed to get surgery because it was pushing on the, my ureter to my right kidney and mm -hmm. didn't want that to be, you know, it was pinched off, kind of pinched like a straw. And he suggested I have surgery. So between the two doctors, they insisted, you know, that I should have this done. And so jokingly, I said, well, fine, if you can schedule it in between my daughter's high school graduation and her graduation party in the summer, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Not thinking that they would be able to do that. And um, well, they did. And so I ended up having to have a total hysterectomy. And that night in the hospital was when I, the next morning I said to Tim, um, whatever I can do to keep myself out of this hospital I want to do that because it brought back all the memories of my mom being in and out and everything that she had gone through and if there was something I could do to keep myself out of there that's what I was doing so that was 2015 and I have not turned back from being whole food plant-based and since then and you know I, I tell people it's it's not about the weight loss it's about your health and it's about how you feel and that's weight loss as a side effect mm -hmm. that's the theme that we come across over and over again in the, yeah. the plant-based world is that it's about your health and the weight loss is secondary whereas with other approaches it's like you know the weight loss is the main thing um so you know this is, is something that we find just so much more compelling about the plant-based thing mm -hmm. now when when tim was sort of on his downward spiral with his health what were you thinking through all of this um 
you know, when he was gaining weight and getting sicker and sicker and how, how, what were your thoughts about, you know, the direction of things and what could be done about it? Well, my first thing was, you know, I have two children that I need to take care of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were told from his doctor that this is what Tim had and this is what he had to do. You know, I, I would fight with Tim, you know, I would literally, we would be working. I had a commercial cleaning business at the time and he would have me hold his Lortab pills so that I would give it to him when he needed it, but it was always early. He always wanted things, you know, he wanted them earlier. And that was really hard for me because I didn't want to give it to him because I'm, I follow instructions. That's what I do. I go by directions and I'm like, no, you can't have this. And, but then yet I knew where he was at, at least that's what we were told. And how could I not have sympathy for him? And, mm -hmm. you know, I would give in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I honestly didn't know where things would go. I just felt like this is what we had to do. I, you know, even encouraged him one time um, to, that maybe he needed to get one of those motor scooters. I mean, think anything that I could do to help make his life easier as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, you got on the Parthates thing and, and then, uh, so what happened? Obviously your problems started to reverse themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, when Heather talks about the, the motor school, I, I remember uh, she actually was um, chaperoning a field trip for one of the kids mm -hmm. and she came home kind of like real subtly and said, Oh, such and such as dad had a um, mobility scooter because he had some back issues and like he was able to come on the field trip. And it was like a drop and a hint at me because I had got to the point where I couldn't go anywhere. If it, if the drive was over 20 minutes, um, all the drugs I was on, I was so nauseous. I, I couldn't sit in the car without getting car sick. And by this point, I was in uh, knee immobilizers. I wasn't in braces, right? I was in immobilizers where my I was like walking on sticks um because they would just lock my knees up because they didn't want them bending anymore they're, they're, I was actually signed up for a surgery to get both of my kneecaps removed um oh. just because they I I would wake up and they'd be on the side of my knee it was pretty wild and so I I really don't like talking about physical activity anymore but I think it's important because for us um the physical activity part has really what's given us a new life, right? All these things that I was so limited on. Yeah, and, I, and I love telling people about, you know, my cholesterol being 103 total instead of over 300 on Lipitor. And I could rattle off all these things. I could tell you that um, the, my health insurance company in 2009 spent $19,000 just on pharmaceuticals. And after I adopted a plant-based lifestyle, and so that would be, I think, I'm trying to think, 2012 or 13, 13, 13, I asked for my reports. The same company spent $121 on B12. So the economic impact is insane. That yeah. is really cool stuff, mm -hmm. right? Wow. But the, the stuff, in my opinion, that's been the best part of my transformation, first of all, is watching Heather shed not only 90 pounds, but we are the kids that would skip school the day they did that military fitness thing because we had to run a mile. Um, you know, we would forget our gym clothes if we had to run. And to watch her run marathons and just <laughs> that she gets a little competitive that you know that her eye is like when she's coming to that finish line is beautiful it's a beautiful thing and probably the the other cool things that have happened that people don't sometimes you know correlate with a, a plant-based lifestyle is i remember so i told you heather would put my socks and shoes on me and i got to return the favor um i was able to help her put her backpack on when she was struggling 
but we were 6,700 feet in the air because we just summited Mount Washington together. Oh, wow. For our anniversary. And, you know, that was a big deal. You know, a big deal. I'm a guy, I was supposed to be, you know, in a wheelchair mm -hmm. and we climbed up Tuckerman's Ravine like it was our job, you know. Um, my kids, the first walk I ever took, we were supposed to, Heather finally convinced me to take a walk. I was still in immobilizers at the time. And it took me almost an hour. And I was supposed to walk about three quarters of a mile, turn around and come back. Um, and I didn't make the turnaround. So it was very humiliating. Heather had to run back, get the kids, pick me up. And what's super cool about that is we would get together on a trail. But this time, my kids, instead of going back to get the car, they were my pace crew for my first 50 mile ultra marathon. Oh wow. my wow. God. And you know, I'm an EDS patient. I'm not supposed to be walking and I'm running 50 mile races, which is so, it's just so beautiful, you know? Mm -hmm. We see that you've got rocks of trophies and, yeah. and uh, medals there. I assume yeah. from running events. Yeah. 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 So then I got into, um, I got into Ironman and doing, you know, long distance bike rides. And sometimes I'll go ride 120 miles on a Saturday. And um, I still have a lot of issues with the EDS, mm -hmm. um, but we worked through it. And, you know, I just had my ankle fused. I had a big back surgery, had a, a muscle reattached here, but we keep going in. You know, I think attitude has a lot to do with it having a positive attitude being grateful uh, the plant-based lifestyle uh, the the plants keep that inflammation at bay so i'm not always dealing with the pain of inflammation and staying strong uh, my muscles have taken over where my joints kind of fail and it's a it's a perfect recipe um you know to have fun really you know yeah. to live an active life enjoy life do, do, do you use any painkillers now at all or i do not no i'd rather die yeah no is that right yeah. fact, it's a little off topic but i had a four level laminectomy uh which is a pretty pretty major surgery mm -hmm. and i waited until the team i think there was about eight people on the team they started wheeling me back and i'm like look at i gotta tell you guys something I purposely waited because I didn't want to argue with them before. I said, I do not want any opioids um, mm. before, during, or after the surgery. Wow. And they all stopped. <laughs> they pushed me back in the little cubby and they said, okay, we're going to meet. And then they all left and the anesthesiologist came in and he said, so what's the deal with the opioids? And I'm like, well, about 10 years ago, you know, I made myself a promise that I would never take opioids again. And he goes, well, you're not going to relapse. He goes, in fact, you're not even going to know that you had them because you'll be under. And that's when I told him, I said, I'm going to start crying. Mm. I said, I made myself two promises. And one was to never have opioids in my body again. And the second one was never break the first promise. And I said, I'd rather die. Like, just, you know, let's cancel the surgery. And he goes, no, we're going to see what we can do. So as far as I know, I am the first person at Sisters Hospital that ever had such a such a serious surgery, um, and I didn't need any. And I had I had another problem about two years ago, um, where my ankle was so bad they offered me either amputation or a fusion. Obviously, I took the fusion, and I was able to do that surgery uh, with no narcotics either. And um, I. I think I did great. I really wasn't in pain that much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I use music, I relax, I meditate, I pray, I read, and um, get through it, you know? Wow. Oh, that's Unbelievable. incredible. That's incredible. Unbelievable. Huh. So I assume that they gave you stuff like, uh, like non-steroidal painkillers? Yeah, but we had to be careful, especially for the back, because there was a lot of this very traumatic surgery. So they didn't want to uh, thin the blood out too much. So um, yeah. I did. I think the only thing I really used on that was um, like a muscle relaxer for because I got a lot of spasms. But that was only for about three days. And okay. geez, I think uh, day three, we had already walked a uh, 5K together, right? Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. My wow. That's incredible. This is so inspiring. I just, 
I have to say, I love, 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 love how transparent you are being. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I, it's, I could, I could argue I have struggled with food addictions and I certainly have suffered from alcohol abuse disorder. And I can think back, you know, I was almost killed in a farming accident and I became addicted to Demerol. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember being in the hospital, I would fake I was in pain. So I'd get a shot of Demerol. I loved sure. that. Um, and, you know, I didn't know it at the time I was so young, but it, it clearly set the stage for me, you know, um, I think a light bulb got lit up and, and I think that the, a lot of people, certain individuals have a proclivity to addictions. And, um, I see a lot of cross addiction and your story is just one of such great hope. It's, hmm. it's like, look at all the stuff that you have overcome and with the support of Heather, mm -hmm. yeah. because this, I'm sure it was equally hard on you, Heather. I mean, one of those one of those awards back there is for you, right? For for, oh, for no half of them actually. Together, I and, the bottom and, half are hers. Uh, oh wow! <laughs> I mean, it's it's and you know I lost my mom almost two years ago to cancer, and so it, you know well you know but I'm just listening to everything you're saying, and I'm like, you know, it's like Lee and I like to talk about the fact that it's funny. It's about food, but it's really more than that. It's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how, what you put in your mouth. I mean, I just remember about a month into becoming whole food plant-based. I remember waking up and just feeling clear, just clear headed. Like I felt clean. I felt so clean and clear. And so there's gotta be a lot of stuff going on that is above and beyond just lowering cholesterol, like you have said, losing weight. I, you know, and and the inflammation issue, but there's got to be a lot of mental health benefits to eating oh, green leafy vegetables. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But it's thought there might even well, there you know, there's the newest thinking on depression is that it may actually be uh, like an inflammatory disease, believe it or not. And, um, you know, when you go on a plant-based diet, reduce the inflammation in your body. And maybe that may be why, you know, people that eat plant-based tend to have less anxiety and depression. But um, as, as a medical doctor, I just can't help but ask my, you know, ask you, like, did all of your blood work normalize, your blood pressure oh, yeah. stuff, it all just normalized? Yeah, and fast um, and mm -hmm. very fast. So I asked my doctor one time, um, because because he was trying to get me off these meds as fast as he could because my numbers uh, they were they were falling so rapidly they, I was like missing blood tests. Um, but I asked him one time when he got rid of the Lipitor. I'm like, so what other what drug could could do this? And he goes, there's not one. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh -huh. So he's been super supportive through all mm -hmm. this. And Joyce, just going back to something you said, I really think that people and even in the plant-based community i don't think we get the full you know i don't think we get the full idea of how important this is because this is it's it's not just life or death it is life or death but this is this is this is i don't like i can't even put it into words how important this is because people don't connect like this piece of pizza you'll get your two minutes of happy out of it and it'll taste good and you get to fit in. You don't have to feel like a weirdo because you're bringing your broccoli salad. But the truth is that choice for that piece of pizza can literally make the difference between if your grandkid comes to visit, if they're bringing you diapers in a nursing home, or if they're bringing the grandchild over to play in the backyard with you. It's like that important. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think we just think, well, I don't like broccoli. Well, you know what? Sorry, learn how to like it right. because this is right. life and life yeah. is so precious. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we realize what we take for granted because mm -hmm. most of us aren't, you know, exposed to this world of people that are sick, you know? Yeah. You know what? It's, it's cold. I didn't want to go out for a walk this morning, but you know what? I know what? There's 2,000 people in the hospitals in Buffalo right now that would give anything to go for that walk. So it's not just a matter of if you want to or not. You mm -hmm. know, do it because someone else can, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. And I think, you know, we were just talking about this uh, this afternoon. The problem is the unhealthy habits are so normalized and entrenched yeah. in our society yeah. that uh, sometimes if you're uh, like the kid saying the emperor has no clothes on, you're seen as a bit of a weirdo when you point out the truth. I was relating an anecdote 
uh, from the hospital that he used to work at up until fairly recently, a few years ago, a young guy came in, long story short, a young guy had a heart attack uh, in his 30s. They uh, managed to get a pulse back, you know, flew him out to a, a bigger center. He got a stent in, he survived. And uh, he was very, very thankful to the hospital, you know, for having saved his life. And, uh, you know, very well-spoken young man. And he, they asked him to be the keynote speaker at the annual gala fundraiser for the hospital. And he gave this, you know, heart-wrenching story about his recovery and, you know, his, his, uh, his kids have a dad, you know, his wife didn't lose her husband and so on. And it was just one of those things where, you know, five, six, seven hundred people there, you could hear a pin drop with him telling his story and how thankful he was to the hospital. And um, um, the ultimate irony was that the dinner served was filet mignon, which is a known uh, cause of heart disease. And so like even the hospitals and the doctors don't get this connection between what we eat and our health and happiness. Um, right. It's really, really unfortunate. Um, but, uh, you know, people like you do, you are doing a great job uh, sort of making this apparent. Um, and we're, yes. you know, we're so happy that you've been able to, been able to talk to us. Um, but just changing the subject, you know, I heard you speak uh, to Chef AJ and you said something that was really fascinating that kind of broke the mold a little bit on the plant-based thing that the traditional thinking in the plant-based diet is that um, the foods are lower in calorie density, they're satisfying of themselves and people will tend to not overeat on them. But you said something that really stuck with me that you really like black beans and that um, you would even actually, if given the opportunity, you would probably overeat on black beans and that you have to use your own conscious thought to sort of make sure you don't overeat. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I know I go against the grain a little bit on this yeah. one because, yeah. because what I was taught and it worked, um, you know, I don't want to start saying doctor's names, but you can eat like starch, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you can eat pretty much all the starch you want. Your belly can only hold so much. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll feel full and it's impossible to get a calorie surplus mm -hmm. because you can only eat five pounds of food. So that might be true um, for most people, but I am not most people. So I have a very addictive behavior. I, even if it, you know, even Iron Man, like it, I don't know, it takes a special kind of person to do a 140 mile race. Um. So for me, I have to be careful. And so I brought up, and I know Chef AJ doesn't like this, I brought up the idea of not so much, I mean, you don't have to count your calories, but you should have an awareness of what, you know, these calories are. So I believe the example I was using is rice and especially brown rice. I love brown rice and I can eat four, five, six quarts of brown rice at a sitting. So what really should be done is someone that's a volume eater. You don't get to be over 400 pounds by not being a volume eater, by the way. So a volume eater um, should eat their non-starchy salads and non-starchy first mm -hmm. and then switch to the starch uh, when they got some, some cushion in there. And the other thing that a whole food plant-based uh, diet does is it will stretch your stomach. I know Heather's uh, can Heather's appetite has gotten a lot bigger on whole foods, um, you know, and it's just because of the bulkiness of the fiber and the water and all the stuff that we eat is really good, you know. Um, obviously, uh, you know, um, I don't know, a, a bag of green beans doesn't have a whole lot of calories in it, but it's pretty bulky. Uh, compared to, I don't, I don't know, like a deep fried something or other. But the point here is, um, yeah, I think you can definitely still gain weight on whole foods. Um, you do have to be conscious, but it's definitely a nice safety net. I mean, I know I overeat because the truth is um, I'm not eating mindful, right? Why do I need to eat three apples when one tastes fine? Well, that's because I have that addictive thing. And if one is good, then three must be super good, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's more of an awareness thing. And like, I don't want to tick anyone off. Uh, but then you get into cashews and especially seeds. Mm -hmm. People don't realize that seeds are actually much more calorie dense than nuts if you, if you look at it. So um, I know Heather has a cashew allergy. So we were spinning up uh, sunflower seed sauce. 
And I started looking into the calories. I'm like, holy cow, man, these are up there. So you do have to be conscious of these whole foods, mm-hmm. they can have a lot of calories. Mm-hmm. So instead of like the sunflower dressing, cashew dressing, you know, I switch over to salsa and use mm-hmm. that as a dressing or find a vinaigrette that, you know, a fruit vinaigrette. Mm-hmm. Or bean based. You could yeah. swap the cashews out for white beans and you really won't notice the difference that much. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. How, how long did it take for your taste buds to change over so till you really started to enjoy this new way of eating? Well, for me on the fast, uh, I could have ate anything after I was done fasting um, because that was 30 days of no food. So I think, you know, that apple, in fact, it's funny that you say that because I know like an apple was just like a snack once in a while. Um, But after my taste buds, you know, got dialed down, I remember we live in New York. So Honeycrisp apples were coming out and I took a bite of one of them. And it was so sweet. It hurt my teeth. Like it actually grossed me out. So mm. an apple becomes like too sweet, which is pretty wild to me. Oh, yeah. wow. That's quite the change. Yeah. That's quite yeah. the change. Your stories are inspirational. Yes. And I, I think that you're helping a lot of people and inspiring a lot of people and letting them know what's possible. We're going to stay connected. And uh, I want to make sure that the listening audience um, gets an opportunity to to visit your website. So it's Fat Man Rants, right? At dot uh, com. And Yes. And you've got the summit coming up. I mean, what else would you like? Uh, yeah, I mean, the audience to be aware. Probably what I would like to like people know. What like we're kind of weird. Um, we our Facebook channel uh, kind of grew pretty good, but we're just like normal people. Um, so yeah, if, if people want to follow us on on Facebook, just anything Fat Man Ranch, you'll find us. But probably the the best thing I would like to say is, if you go to the top of the website, we have a full uh, eighty recipe cookbook. It's a PDF download. I mean, we you can buy them, but don't buy them when you can get it for free right there. Download the recipes. That what I, you know, I get embarrassed of the recipes because they're ridiculous. But the truth is, um, going back to that simplicity, there are just simple stuff. You probably have most of these things in your kitchen. They're okay. simple, two, three, four ingredient recipes. And that was when I was successful. And, you know, the funny thing is I'm just being real here. When the soy curls, the tofu, all the things that I didn't know about, you know, got, you know, kind of added to our diet, it made it tougher. It really did. It's a lot easier to overeat tofu than it is green beans, right? And your taste buds change, you know, Mm -hmm. you you start craving that kind of stuff. And so simple is good. Simple is good. And, you know, definitely pull. And you know what? There's so many free resources out there. The tools that are available, you know, it's nothing like when we went Mm -hmm. plant-based 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. what I really want people to know is just how we started this. This is out there for anyone. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as simple as you want it to be. But understand, that doesn't make it easy, Mm -hmm. right? This is a hard thing to do because you're going against the grain and you have social media, media, you have, you know, the package designers, the fast food process, they're all bombarding us, Mm -hmm. you know, and we don't get help from our doctors either, Mm -hmm. but understand it is so stinking worth it. It's so worth it. So Mm -hmm. don't wait, start today. And I guess my best advice is just focus on that next choice in our motto yeah eat plants move your body all you gotta do is a little bit more than you did yesterday yesterday i love that it's like the cheer times two thing (laughs) 